Good morning. It's Monday, August 12th. I'm Karen Hamstra and welcome to Title Talk. I would like to remind you all to pick up your new copy of Book Page for August. This month's focus is new voices in fiction, but there are also many older voices uh, featured and just all kinds of interesting articles. If you walk straight ahead as you come into the main library's doors in the circulation area, you will run right into the new fiction shelves on which our book pages are kept, and you may help yourself to a new free copy each month. You can't get much better than free. Here's our first book of the day. This is a science fiction book by a new author, Kira Jane Buxton, has written Hollow Kingdom. And looking at this cover, would you want to guess who the main character in this book is? It is a crow, and the crow's name is S.T. He's a domesticated crow, and he lives with his owner, Big Jim, um, and Big Jim's dog. The problem is that one day on a beautiful summer evening, Big Jim's eyeball falls out of his head, and S.T., the crow, starts to feel like something isn't quite right, and he sets off on horseback to find a solution to these problems and he finds out that the city of Seattle where they live uh, isn't quite like their peaceful farmstead and but he uh, plugs along and he's brimming with hope and heart and this is a build as an irrepressible debut that introduces humanity's improbable hero in the form of a foul-mouthed crow with a moderate to severe junk food addiction who believes that despite, despite all its flaws, the world is worth saving. So this is a new author, Kira Jane Buxton. We have a fantasy novel by Tom Miller who is an emergency room physician and apparently has time somehow to engage in flights of fantastical imagination and fancy. And this is the second in his series. The first was called The Philosopher's Flight. And this is The Philosopher's War. And it says, the world needs a new kind of hero. The Associated Press remarked that Miller's writing is intoxicating. And Kirkus Reviews, which is one of our standard review publications for libraries that we use to select books, says an even more propulsive follow-up to emergency physician Miller's imaginative debut, The Philosopher's Flight. It's a fantastic example of world building on a grand scale that combines cinematic action with historical accuracy to great effect. <clears throat> Miller has accomplished something really grand here. The combat is incredibly tense. The palpable tension between characters is genuinely authentic, and the characters are the character arc that changes weeks from an eager young soldier to a hardened veteran is truly compelling. Um, and it begins with says he came to save lives, but has no idea how far he'll have to go to win the war, and. Um, I believe this comes at the end of World War I, also known as the Great War. A historical novel by Tim Pears, The Redeemed. Um, he has written ten other books. This takes place in 1916. It's about a young man named Leo Sercom, who is hauling coal aboard the HMS Queen Mary. Um, and it says, in a world torn asunder by war, everything dances in flux. How can the old ways of life survive? And how can the future be imagined in the face of such unimaginable change? How can Leo, lost and wandering in the strange and brave new world, ever hope to find his way home? And this is the final installment in Tim Pear's acclaimed West Country Trilogy, and it is The Redeemed. A story of love lost and destiny fulfilled and a bittersweet elegy to a lost world. And I do not believe you have to have read the previous two volumes to find this one quite enjoyable. We have another historical fiction book, In the Full Light of the Sun, by Clave, I think. Claire. <laughs> Claire Clark. Pardon me, Claire. Um, 
the cursive writing on the front of the cover is not real legible. This book takes place in the turbulent, turbulent years between the wars in Berlin where nothing is quite what it seems. The main character is Emmeline, a wayward young artist who is going about wildly throughout the city. Julius, another main character, is an eminent art connoisseur who finds it easier to love paintings than people. And Frank, a Jewish lawyer who must find a way to protect his family and his principles as the Nazis begin their rise to power. But the greatest enigma is Matthias, the mercurial art dealer who connects them all. Charming and ambitious, he will provoke a scandal involving newly discovered paintings by Vincent Van Gogh that turns all of their lives upside down. In the Full Light of the Sun by Claire Clark. We also have a new one called Mary Lou is Everywhere by Sarah Elaine Smith. It's of no particular genre, just new fiction. Uh, an interesting premise. 14-year-old uh, Cindy and her two older brothers live in rural Pennsylvania in a house with occasional electricity, two fierce dogs, one book, and a mother who comes and goes for months at a time. Uh, they are deprived of adult supervision, and the older Cindy gets, the less tenable her life at home becomes. So when a glamorous teen from a far more affluent cultured home goes missing, Cindy escapes her own family's poverty and slips into the missing teen's life. As Jude Vanderjohn, Cindy is suddenly surrounded by books and art, by new foods and traditions, and most important, by a startling sense of possibility. In her borrowed life, Cindy experiences overwhelming maternal love for the first time and in the process must reckon with her own deceits, learning what it means to be a daughter, a sister, and a neighbor. Mary Lou is everywhere. Sarah Elaine Smith. And our last fiction book to the day, for the day is Kristen Higgins' new book, Life and Other Inconveniences. Uh, Emma London, she never thought she had anything in common with her grandmother, Genevieve London. The regal old woman came from wealthy New England stock, but that did not protect her from life's cruelest blows. Uh, her young son disappeared, her husband died prematurely, but the grandmother rose from the ashes and built a fashion empire, respected the world over, burying her grief in her work, even when it meant neglecting her other son. When Emma's own mother died, her father abandoned her on Genevieve's doorstep. The matriarch took her in and reluctantly raised her until Emma pregnant her senior year of high school. At that point, Genevieve kicked her out with nothing but the clothes on her back. But Emma took with her the most important London passion, the strength not just to survive, but to thrive. And indeed, Emma has built a wonderful life for herself and her teenage daughter, Riley. So what is Emma to do when Genevieve does the one thing Emma never expected of her and, not speaking to her for nearly two decades, calls and asks for help? Well, we hope that she goes and helps her, but you'll need to read the book to find out for sure. Life and Other Inconveniences by Kristen Higgins. Uh, I have four nonfiction books I'd like for you to take a look at. The first one by John Glatt is called The Family Next Door. Do you remember the family in California who had held their 13 children prisoner in their house? Um, they ranged from age 2 to 29. Um, they were, they, when they did come out, they would all dress alike. Uh, they were all very malnourished. And this is their story. And if you like that kind of story, you will probably enjoy this book. It is The Heartbreaking Imprisonment of the Thirteen Turpin Siblings and Their Extraordinary Rescue. The call number is 362.76092. The Family Next Door by John Glott. G-L-A-T-T. -T. Then we have The Complete Family Guide to Addiction. Um, it's a sad subject. The book can be called at three six call number. It's it's found at three six two point two nine. The author is Thomas F. Harrison, and the other author is Hillary S. Connery. 
MD, PhD. Um, it's everything you need to know how now to help your loved one and yourself, why addicts act the way they do, how to get an addict into treatment and pay for it, what to expect from recovery and relapse, how to keep an addict out of trouble, and how to keep your family together. Uh, if you don't know a family that has been affected by addiction, you are very fortunate indeed. I myself know several families who have lost loved ones because of this horrible plague. So I would encourage you, if you're having this problem, to get a hold of this book and see what it might offer you in terms of help. Again, it's at 362.29HAR. Um, another World War II book, The Liberation of Paris, How Eisenhower, de Gaulle, and von Kollitz Saved the City of Light by Jean Edward Smith, who is a well-known historian. Um, and it is exactly what it says, is it says it is, a story about the liberation of Paris. Of course, Eisenhower and de Gaulle were on the Allies' side. Von Kollitz was the Nazi commander in Paris. And this tells the story of how he conspired, because he knew the city was lost to the Nazis, to surrender it intact rather than have it go through a bombing. The call number is a long one. So I would advise you just to come in and look on the new shelf for the liberation of Paris. It is at 940.5421-4361, SMI. And last but not least, we're just getting a ton of World War II books because we keep having all of these significant anniversaries of the war. This one is called Culture in Nazi Germany. The author is Michael H. Kotter, K-A-T-E-R. It has a nice simple call number, 700. That's it, just plain 700. <laughs> um, and this is a book about how the Nazis used things like operas, propaganda posters, kitsch paintings of mountains and poems that celebrated blood and soil to champion the Nazi, Nazi cause. They were all part of a male-dominated and anti-modern world ruled by violence and sentimentality. Culture was, for the Nazis, a tool of propaganda, a way to intimidate or encourage the people, and it was surprisingly essential to the running of the Third Reich. So, Culture in Nazi Germany, 700 CAT. That's it for today. It's been nice talking with you. I'll see you next week.